Welcome to Rock Bottom Ranch, where your choice is smoke or rain on our events. It's one of the two. Tonight we got smoke from California, where our speaker is from. She brought the smoke with her. Usually you hear the snow. Well, I'm Chris Lane with Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Welcome to another Jessica Caddo Dialogue, a speaker series honoring the environmental legacy of Miss Jessica Javi Caddo. And um, this is where we feature environmental doers, environmental thinkers who are changing the world. This series was created and supported by Henry Caddo, Jessica's husband, and, and, and Jessica's memory. I want to give a special thanks to Daniel Shaw and Issa Caddo for their continued support through this lecture series and their leadership. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know ACES, know that we, the main thing we do is connect people with nature. And at Rock Bottom Ranch, here, this 113 acre ranch, we're transforming the way people think about food systems and farming. And the other thing of many things we do is ed provide ecological literacy, something much needed in our society today. Our speaker today, Miss Jennifer Jewell, who came all the way from California, uh, she's a gardener, she's a garden writer, she's a gardening educator and advocate, and since 2016, she's written a nationally award-winning podcast and radio show, Cultivating Place. She writes about the intersection between gardening, native plant environments, and human culture. And since 1998, her work has appeared in such places as House Garden, Old House Journal, Garden Illustrated, Colorado Homes and Lifestyle. She's written several books, Under Western Skies, The Earth in Her Hands as well, over here, you may get one. But to introduce our speaker, to give a real introduction to our speaker, is Miss Issa Caddo tonight. And she's going to give us an introduction. And Issa, I'm going to give you a quick introduction. I know you don't want one. But Issa has spent the last 30 years as an artist, a designer, a writer, as well as a teacher in many art institutions around the country. She also writes a regular column for the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And she's a big, and this is probably my favorite thing about Issa. And she's a big advocate for social justice, the arts, and climate change, and conservation. And probably my other favorite thing about Issa is she's married to a pretty cool dude <laughs> named Daniel Shaw. My favorite thing about Issa. <laughs> <laughs> named Daniel Shaw, who is also Ace's board chair. So, and Daniel, thank you for everything you do for Ace's. So Issa, come to the stage. Up here without any fanfare. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Chris. That Chris went above and beyond because uh, that was a lot of fanfare. Um, I promise I will be brief, brief and deliver the main attraction of the fabulous Jennifer Jewell. And um, Daniel, that Daniel, uh, urged me to tell the story of this lecture series. So here, here goes it. Um, the day after my mother died, my father, sister, and I stood in her mm -hmm. own frostbitten fall garden and asked us to start brainstorming ways to honor her memory. This lecture series evolved from that day and became a reality with my father Henry's generosity and Ace's incredible stewardship. Uh, my mother's fabled garden lives on in my own since I harvested hundreds of her seeds and divided dozens of perennials before their property was sold. I love that her prized delphiniums keep me company year after year. So it makes sense that we've come full circle by welcoming Jennifer here. Um, you may have read her books. Sorry, this is all out of order. That's all cattywampus. You may have read her books, The Earth in Her Hands and Under Western Skies, but if you've not listened to her podcast, Cultivating Place, do. Jennifer pulls gardens and gardeners out of the stereotypical portrayals. She spotlights connections and intersections and reinforces that keeping gardens are not only acts of love and creativity, but also a commitment to social justice, equity, mental health, and conservation. There are two constant threads in her work 
One is the importance of inclusivity and how gardens play a role in welcoming any and all into a space. The other is that gardens are an antidote to an increasingly transactional world that spins around influencers, celebrities, and the stratospherically wealthy. By contrast, there is no predictable return in nurturing growth from the ground up. Tending a garden is a collaboration with so many partners, elk, foxes, birds, pollinators, voles, wind, water, and it forces you to yield illusions of control and to pay attention to small and powerful forces in the earth at hand. That's a good thing. So I turn you over to Jennifer. Welcome. Thank you so much, Issa uh, and Chris and everybody at ACES and Rock Bottom Ranch and Hallam Lake who uh, welcomed us yesterday. Um, sorry about the smoke. We didn't bring it with us, but it, it, did, it did arrive uh, a few days before us. And I'm, I'm here with my partner, plantsman John Whittlesey, who's at the back of the room. And I was sort of moaning that it was sad that I was coming back to my home state of Colorado with the smoke from California. And he said, no, it's a good thing because it reminds us that we are connected in our challenges just as we are connected in our solutions. And I thought that was a really, a really good perspective, um, you know, especially in these exact times. Um, I am, I'm honored and, and flabbergasted in some ways uh, to, to be here today. I was born and raised at 8,000 feet, Lookout Mountain, Colorado, and I spent summers as a child on a little sort of homestead cabin in Paonia. My father is a wildlife biologist and my mother is a gardener, was a gardener uh, and floral designer. And so this really, like to come here feels very much like home. And uh, I've been in California for some time now, but still to like drive over Independence Pass and just, you know, see the flowers and see the trees and smell the air, it's very, even tinged by California, um, it is very much home, which is a great uh, full circle for me. So it's an honor to be here, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, and, you know, I am here really to do what I always do in, in my current work, which is to celebrate the role of gardeners and gardening in our world. And, um, to talk about this sort of group of people specifically who are uh, gardeners really engaged with their place in, in my current book. But I, I do this through a lens that is what informs my public radio program and podcast. So I'm gonna back up and give you a, a lot of history before we actually get to the book because uh, the book is just one way of looking at the gardening world through this very specific lens. Uh, can everybody hear me well enough? Okay. And um, so I was born and raised in Colorado, 8,000 feet. My mother, a gardener and a floral designer. Um, you all know gardening at 8,000 feet is no easy task, uh, but it has some of its own very specific rewards. and. Uh, both my parents came from the East Coast and they uh, actually came to Colorado for my father to do his dissertation um, in wildlife biology in Colorado. <clears throat> and they were pregnant with me when they came across and I was born here. And I say all this because I was raised by two people who firmly believed, um, they didn't talk about it a lot, but they firmly believed in the importance of knowing where you were of knowing what watershed you were in, of knowing the names of the trees and the condition of the soil and <clears throat> how all of those things work together. And that was just built into my family life as part of our cultural history uh, and literacy, uh, to pull a phrase that Chris pulled out earlier, uh, ecological literacy, in my opinion, is one of the foundational elements of our cultural literacy. Uh, and its absence is, uh, tells us as much as its presence does. And 
So it wasn't until I was a little bit older and becoming an adult and moving into the world on my own that I didn't, that I came to realize that not everybody was raised that way, that not everybody could recognize basic plant life or uh, basic topographical features. And I found that really interesting. I, I went on to you know, go to school. I actually went to uh, boarding school for high school uh, with Gretchen Cole. And um, so I've actually been to Rock Bottom Ranch before, which is another full circle. And so, but as I move out into the world, I, you know, I go to school, I, I follow the same expectations that many of us in the room might have followed. And I go and I get a job, and I get a great job at Microsoft and Carta Encyclopedia. And um, I'm a writer and an editor, and that's one of my great loves. And that's what I really think I want to do with my life. I want to be a writer. And, um, but I'm also, for the first time, in my own home. And I have a, a little space, a tiny little suburban space in Seattle, Washington. And I, my gardening gene just comes out in like everything I do. And, you know, I get home from work and I work in the garden and I visit all the nurseries and I just fall in love with this activity called gardening. And I then eventually learn to sort of marry my love of gardening with my love of writing. And I think, what a great job to write about gardening. Perfect. And, and it was really a beautiful, um, coming together for a while. And this was about 1993. And I'm writing for places like House and Garden and Gardens Illustrated out of the UK. And that all seems, I mean, as a gardener, let's see a show of hands. Who, who in the audience would identify one part of your life as being a gardener? Okay, right, okay. And I, so I'm writing for these magazines that you will recognize the names of as being like top of the field and great resources. But it only takes about three years or so before I'm writing for these magazines. And, and I'm not trying to diss these magazines. They are a vehicle for a cultural norm that I'm going to be talking about. When I and the garden editor for actually Colorado Homes and Lifestyles for a few years, and I get more and more disenchanted with the way the articles in these magazines and these pictures in these magazines are portraying this act that I am called to do and have no real choice. Like, I am a gardener by nature. My mother was a gardener by nature. I once asked my aunt, who was a, the head gardener at Ash Lawn, a historic garden outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, um, why she gardened. And she's like, well, why do I breathe? Like, that's what I do. And that the, the mainstream media was portraying gardening in a more and more two-dimensional, pretty picture, commodified status symbol activity. And that was not how I experienced gardening at all. And I see a couple of heads nodding around the room. So I think you know what I'm talking about. And that it made me increasingly unhappy to be a person that was perpetuating this. And I had gotten to a point where I realized that that superficial level was actually perpetuating so much of the of what I was taking issue with as an adult, raising small children, worried about climate change, worried about cultural polarization or issues, like so many of the challenges could be um, seen in this one thing that was just wrong in my mind. So I decided I wasn't gonna write for glossy magazines anymore and I was just gonna enjoy my own garden, but I was gonna try and figure out a different way to talk about gardening. And my former husband and I moved to Northern California and we, uh, I was just going you know, in a car down the street, taking kids to school, whatever moms do, and which is a lot of taking kids to school. Um, and I hear on the radio a public service announcement request for volunteers at our local public radio station. And I thought, 
I'm a big fan of public radio. It's free access. It is, you know, good news. It is, uh, it's one of the things that I think is a good communicative voice in our world. And I think that's what I want to do. So I want to have a garden program on the radio because then I get to talk about not just what our gardens look like, but what our gardens mean to us and what our gardens feel like to us. Because of everybody in this room that raised their hand when they said, I am a gardener, how many more articles do you need about the 10 top things to put in your containers this summer, right? And granted, I will look through my glossy magazines and I will like find ideas, but if you have gardened for even a short amount of time, that's no longer all that you want to read about. And that level of engagement around the voices doing what they do in horticulture um, became my primary motivator. And the reason it became my primary motivator and the whole reason that I am standing before you today and that I do anything that I do and I promise I'm gonna change shots in a minute. Um, everything I do is predicated on this belief that is born out time and again in my life that gardeners are, and gardens and gardening, so all three of those forms of what I'm talking about are incredibly powerful potential intersectional agents and spaces for change in our world. Now, that phrase coming out of my mouth after the last two or three years, it sounds like a soundbite. It sounds like rhetoric. But let me unpack it a little bit for you so it starts to make more sense. When I say the word gardener, if you closed your eyes and an image came into your head of what a gardener is, there's probably two, two stereotype images that come up for you. One looks exactly like me. Middle class, middle aged, white woman who like has a lot of leisure time, I guess, and spends it in the garden. The irony is not lost on me that it is me speaking to you. The other would be, you know, some happy person that is hired in and comes to a, a neighborhood or a garden and like tidies up and mows and blows and prunes a couple things twice a year and goes away and that is another kind of gardener. But when we think a little more deeply about it, and this is sort of where my program goes, um, it gardening is one of these activities that we as humans do differently than any other species on the planet that is an incredible expression of our humanity and it is documented in every single culture across time and space. So it's one of these spaces where all of the things that divide us can actually be transcended by what connects us. So it doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman or you're short or you're fat or you're a child or you're an elder or you are black or Hispanic or LBGTQ or you are an ancient Egyptian or you are you know, somewhere in the future. If you are human, it is likely that you will have gardening in your cultural landscape. And so that to me, is, is like art or music or literature or food or love. It is one of these spaces where we can come together and actually decide to move needles because we can connect over what we love. So the kinds of things that I talk about, and I, I actually will have people call in and be like, this, this program isn't about gardening at all. <laughs> and, and, um, but I never promised it to be a how-to. It was always going to be a why. And there is how-to built into it. Has anybody in the room listened to the podcast much at all? A couple of people? So you will know what I'm talking about. But I, I speak not just about a person gardening today and like you know what they pruned or, or what they planted or where they got their seeds, but I talk to artists and growers and scientists and uh, poets and public policy makers and just straight up home gardeners. And I 
talk about their story and their context, and then I talk about where their horticultural love kind of connects to something bigger in the world, whatever that might be. And um, so this gives you a little sample of some of the people that I, I talk to and what I talk about. We talk about birds and we talk about wildlife and we talk about community action. And, um, and it has been incredibly well received because there are, you know, as many of us sitting in this room, there are that exponentially around the world who are hungry, hungry to take their gardening impulse and to actually elevate it into something that is not dismissed or demeaned or um, seen as a superficial accessory to their life, but is kind of claimed as one of the elements that makes their life worth living and actually connects to the larger world to improve it on a whole variety of levels. So in 2000, and, um, so I started my program in 2007, but it was a smaller program, very regionally based. And it was based on the reception of that program that my radio station came to me and said, we'd like you to you know, change it into a one hour program and um, it will go, you know, it's sort of syndicated and the podcast reaches globally. And, and, and the reception has been really uh, telling as to how many people are interested in this. So, you know, something like 400,000 listeners a year uh, tune into the episodes, which is really interesting to me and, um, and gratifying. In 2017, Timber Press, who's a big horticultural press in the U.S., came to me and said, would you be interested in writing a book on women in horticulture? And I said, well, if you've listened to my program, and you still want me to write the book on women in horticulture, I would be very interested in that. And that was my first book, The Earth in Her Hands. And it is about sort of women around the globe who are kind of expanding the way we think about horticulture and the way we think about gardening uh, into something bigger and broader. So people like Robin Wall Kimmerer and um, the head of the... Uh, uh, the U.S. Botanic Garden and herbalists and scientists um, and I turned that book in and they turned right around and said now we are interested in you perhaps taking on this second book um, and I literally had turned in the first book uh, and I was sort of like wow I don't know that's a lot um, but they said to me it's a book about gardens in the West, and it's a book about place. And the title of my program is Cultivating Place, Conversations on Natural History and the Human Impulse to Garden. And this second book seemed to me like the perfect complement to the first book in carrying forward the mission and the purpose of the podcast, which is to engage and encourage and empower home gardeners to say, I am not just a home gardener. What did you do today? We, we do this to ourselves. What did you do today? Oh, I didn't, I mean, I didn't do anything. I just gardened. Um, and you know, when people will say, well, what are, what, what are you? And I'm like, well, I'm a gardener. And, and it's, it's a little confusing to people if you're not a professional gardener or, you know, or a mow and blow team. And, um, and yet, because of the power I see in these roles of home gardeners to affect change, uh, I think it's really important that we, again, sort of embrace and step into that power. Because when you think of it, what is a garden except for a marriage of a person to a place? And if any of you are married, you will know that it is better to work towards a good marriage for both people than a good marriage for just one of the participants. So if you can make the person and the place happier, uh, you will be better off. So the idea for the book was brought to the publisher by a photographer, Caitlin Atkinson. And Caitlin is a phenomenally uh, just insightful photographer. And it was interesting to me that in doing The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Women Working in the World of Plants, one of the kind of 
uh, areas of work that I focused on in the women were photographers. Because again, there is this element of a photograph, you know, and, and there's this sort of confluence of why this is true, of the, the sort of rise of television and the rise of magazines and then the rise of marketing and then, um, you know, that we got to this place where a garden is a status symbol or a commodity or represented by only someone who looks like me. And um, the photographers, and I think anybody who is a garden or garden journal fan will, will know what I'm saying when I say this, is the photographers and the way they photograph things and what they photograph that start to educate or inform us not only on what a garden looks like, but on what a beautiful garden looks like and what your garden should look like. So it's part of what informs that bizarre knee-jerk response of any gardener who says, well, I would have you over, but the garden looked better last week. And, you know, like, I don't want you to see my garden because, you know, it doesn't look like that picture on the cover of that magazine. Um, but nobody's garden looks like that all the time. And if it does, it's not a very lively garden. Let's just say that. And so it was Caitlin who brought this idea to Timber Press. And she said, um, and I actually have the note here because I don't want to get her quote wrong. She came to them and she said, you know, and she's been a, a, a landscape and garden photographer for many years, primarily focused on the West. And there's some interesting things in that as well. But she said, I really want to work on a book that is not just another photographic assignment. I want to work on a book that expresses my love of home and that really celebrates real people working in real gardens and what that really looks like on the ground. And she said beyond that, that her image over the many years of her being a garden photographer, uh, her image of what a good garden is has changed. And I, I think that anybody here who has gardened for any length of time, your idea of what a good garden is has necessarily changed and adapted over this last 10, 20 years. Here's a statistic that I want to throw out that I, I should have mentioned earlier. In the, in the 2018 census, 38% of all US households noted that they identified as gardeners in some way or another. Okay, 38% of all households, that's 49 million households. In 2020, all research is indicating that we had something like another 18 million people come online as active gardeners. So when I say we are a potential, potentially powerful agents and spaces for change, of that 49 million households engaged in gardening, only one fifth noted that they were organic gardeners or habitat gardeners, or social justice gardeners. So when I look down my suburban garden, my suburban street in Northern California, and out of the 20 garden yards, garden you know yards that I can see, and I live in Northern California, okay? We have no water. We do not receive rain from, you know, if we're lucky, April to December. And of those 20 yards, still 15 of them are irrigated mown turf grass. We have a lot to do to actually take that cohort of gardeners and move the needle in a better direction. So that's why I say potential. So Caitlin said uh, that one of her great uh, goals with this book was to really highlight where gardens fit into the world and how gardens can help change the world for the better. And that, of course, she believes in creating beautiful spaces of sanctuary and retreat for us as humans, for our own individual health and well-being. But she also wants to see gardens do more. She wants to make sure that gardens are seen as these places of reconnection. And that brings me to this point of disconnection, which uh, I think a lot of you will, will, it will resonate with you. And I think 
disconnection in this day and age, especially after 2020, um, is, is one of our greatest hobbles. Whether it's disconnection from each other, it's disconnection from uh, ourselves culturally, it's disconnection from nature. Um, we have a lot of disconnection to handle and uh, reconnection uh, through the garden is one of the great potentials that I see. And it in some ways comes down to not just connection but representation. That until representation is well handled, then real connection is almost impossible. And what I mean by that in this exact arena, for this exact gardening focus, is um, because, of course, representation is another very uh, well-used word right now, let's say, and it's a very important concept. But in terms of gardeners, I want especially U.S. Western gardeners, if you see a garden that looks like this, sold to you over and over and over again as the standard of beauty, of the standard of what a garden looks like and is and should be, and this does happen to be Prince Charles's High Grove garden. So, <laughs> so if you're going to get a bad model, that's a pretty good bad model. But my point here is that's a great garden in its place. But if you see a garden look like this, and this is what you're trying to reach as your idea of a beautiful garden, but you live in a place that looks like this, which is a beautiful, beautiful place, but you are trying to reach this other, or you believe you're supposed to try and reach this other standard of beauty, what is gonna happen? And the answer is something like this, okay? And so you look down this street and what do you see? Do you know where you are? No. no. What, what you see is a lot like what I see when I look down my suburban street, and you see a lot of this irrigated turf lawn. Um, and it has become this, uh, and it has been for, you know, tens of decades now, many, many decades, the default standard of what care looks like. And, uh, but if you, the minute you become a little more literate as to what this looks like, you know, you see turf grass, but you also see 40 million acres of this turf grass in the U.S. today. You see the billions of pounds of carbon that are put into our atmosphere by the gas-powered mowers and blowers that care for this. You see the runoff from whatever rain this poor place gets uh, pouring off of that lawn into that hardscape, down into that groundwater, that aquifer not being recharged, you do not see habitat for bees or birds or um, butterflies. You don't even really see habitat for people, right? And so this is not really a cue for care, but it has been held up for that as so long. Um, and it is no longer a benign default. It is a dangerous and harmful default. And you can actually tell that it's somewhere in the US West because there's a little mountain range over in that far corner. And so when this is the standard that we have set for our cultural norm, we are literally lost as a species. We are certainly lost as a democracy of species. And that is heartbreaking, but I will say that in doing the work that I do and in speaking to the gardeners that I speak with and in having worked on these two books, uh, there is plenty of outstanding work being done on the ground. When you are sitting at Rock Bottom Ranch, which is land donated in part and engineered in part to become part of ACES, and to become a regenerative landscape and to teach and educate as also a sort of arm with Howlam Lake. 
Like there is good being done, but the question is connecting to it. And so people will often say, well, you know, what, what should I do? Because I don't have time or I don't have the energy or whatever they might not have. Um, and I think there is, uh, again, in part because of the publishing industry and uh, our just cultural norms, there is this sense that a, a, so a yard that doesn't look like that has to look like a weedy mess or has to be, you know, lava rock and a cactus. And, and you laugh, but people, like, people really think that. You know, and to be honest, like, I was driving over Independence Pass with John and I'm looking at the incredible natural beauty of my home state and I think, what the heck do I have to tell anybody in Aspen and the Roaring Fork Valley about gardening? But then I drove through downtown Aspen and I felt fine. I had plenty to talk about. And because, and that is the whole point of this second book. The whole point is um, what a garden can look like. And, and the sort of thesis that I took into this second book was this, that every single garden, every single garden, including these with just turf lawn. I should go back, so, ruin, yeah, okay. I'm ruining the bad effect. Uh, every single garden is sort of a three-part braid, if you will. And one part is the natural history of the place that you're gardening in. The second part is the cultural sort of legacy that you happen to be gardening in at any one time, which has led to a lot of this in our lifetime. And then the third thing is your own personal life story. So every garden has all three of these. And in some gardens, two of those threads might not be very well nurtured. Maybe just one of them isn't very well nurtured. But they're all there in some fashion, if sometimes it's their absence that is the most telling item. But in a really good garden, all three of those elements are well nurtured. And you can see not only the place that this person is gardening as being well represented, but you also see the, the best of our cultural history being represented in this garden and the most creative expression of the human that is gardening there. And that is what makes our gardens so unique to each of us. And you know a gardener's garden when you walk into it, right? You, you, I, I, I had the joy of going to Hallam Lake yesterday, of getting toured around Rock Bottom Ranch today, of I am sleeping in the garden of Issa Caddo, uh, Mojo Gardens, which is featured in the book, and we're going to get to that. So we got to like wake up, have coffee with bumblebees all around us, and um, and you can see everything that I'm telling you about that. And so in these gardens that are featured in the book, they show you that it's not just about lava rock and a cactus. It is about all of those three things being really well integrated together. This is a front garden in Salt Lake City. This is a front garden in downtown Los Angeles. This is a front garden in Seattle, Washington. This is a hell strip in Fort Collins, Colorado. This is an entirely native Chihuahuan desert garden in Phoenix, Arizona. And this is a fantastic food and wildscape garden in Palo Alto, California. And this is then the book. And I will talk to you a little bit about the structure of the book. But one of the things I love about this picture right here is that one of the gardens in the book is not anything you would recognize as a garden. It sort of looks like that right there. And yet it is the garden of uh, an indigenous elder, and it's her gathering garden. Everything she grows in this garden is for medicinal or cultural purposes and educational purposes. And this is a basket that she wove um, of the rushes, the native rushes in her garden. And I sort of, fit, you know, you look at this little container, and that's really what our gardens are. They are these crucibles for what we want our world to look like. And so the West, is a big place. You know that. I know that. You cannot cover the whole West. You cannot include every visionary garden. Um, but you can get pretty representative. So we broke the West down into the Southwest, Southern California, Northern California, the Intermountain West, and the Pacific Northwest. And 
uh, there's sort of an imaginary line you would draw down the center of the country, you know, or the sort of western side of the country that would include western Texas. Um, we, it was really important to us that even though it is a fancy and expensive, I, I, I know this, uh, coffee table kind of book, that the gardens in it are not all large, well-funded, wealthy people gardens. Um, that is not a model we need in our publishing world anymore either. Uh, so they are public and private gardens because as we know at this point in our country 83% of us live in urban areas and so there are a lot of people who don't have a little piece of land to grow on. Um, they might have a windowsill, they might have a fire escape, they might have a ledge, they might have a stoop or they might have a public park. They might have a botanic garden. And so the public spaces were really important to us to include. Some of them are completely DIY done over 20 years. Some of them are really well-funded professional endeavors that are beautiful. Um, but it was one of the criteria was that every garden in the book had to have the owner be one of the gardeners. They could have help but they had to actually be a hands-in-the-dirt gardener themselves to be in the book. And they are urban and rural. And every sort of written profile in the book includes the personal history, the cultural context, the natural history, uh, including as much as I could get of, you know, longitude and latitude and zone and uh, elevation and annual rainfall and uh, what watershed they were in and who were the indigenous people that had been on this land prior to settlement because I think this is another thing that happens with us as gardeners is that because it is seen as a kind of leisure hobby activity and because it is seen as something very pretty but not that important um, we don't hold ourselves to a high enough standard of intelligence. And the media and what is written about us and to us is often a lower level of sort of intelligence than it should be, in my opinion. And that it's up to us as gardeners to actually elevate that level ourselves. And so in my opinion, I as a gardener think that it's important that any one of us who engages in gardening, we should know our watershed. We should know our standard forest type. We should know what our soil is, what our annual precipitation is, and exactly who the indigenous people were that were on the land that we inhabit now ourselves. I think that's an important standard for us as a cohort to take into the future with us. So now I'm going to introduce you, but first I'm going to check the time because I've been talking for a long time. What time did I start? You guys don't know. You'll just listen to me all night long. Um, OK, so I'm going to introduce you to a handful of the gardens. And I'm going to give you as much of the sort of you know, important elements to the garden as I can, um, all with this idea of inspiring you in your own garden and how you see it and how you portray it to the, the rest of the world. And, um, and what your hopes and goals are for your own gardening impulse as you move forward. So this is a garden in Marfa, Texas. And it is the garden of two men, Jim Martinez and Jim Thistle. They have been on the space for about 10 years. Mm, I think maybe 15 years. And they came to Marfa, Texas. Um, they're big birders. And I know that will make Charlie Cole very happy to hear that. Uh, they and they were on an Audubon hiking trip when they came to Marfa, Texas to a conference. And they just fell in love with this desert. They fell in love with the plants of it. They fell in love with the big skies. They fell in love with the light and the dryness and the monsoon season. And they decided they were going to retire here. So they found a piece of completely overgrazed pasture land. And they would, um, Jim Martinez is sort of the head gardener, he calls himself, and Jim Thistle is kind of the support staff, and he is a computer analyst, and so he does a lot of like CAD drawings to help with the elevation and the, um, the grading of the land for the hydrology, uh, as well as just the layout. And Jim Martinez uh, is a, uh, was, he was an urban forester, and then he worked as a soil scientist for the Forest Service. 
and he ultimately developed his own landscape contracting company in Dallas and Austin. And so they decided to buy this one acre of land in Marfa and they would go on weekends for I think almost seven years. They went every weekend to work on the land, to remove the weedy invasives, to regrade where the water wanted to go, to um, take out some plants, but then also bulk up some of the existing plants that had been put in for wind breaks or shade breaks. And there was no house on it. So they just go and like camp out and work. Um, and their whole goal was to create a bird habitat for the migratory birds coming through Marfa and to include as many species from the Chihuahuan Desert as they possibly could. And I think they have something like I want to say 70 different varieties of seed, of grass, that they grew from seed on this garden. And then eventually they built a house, which is very modern, but also has all these references back to the vernacular indigenous uh, architecture of the region. And Jim Martinez describes himself, he's very funny about this, and he says, I'm kind of one-third Mexican, one-third indigenous, and one-third anything else you can think about. But he was raised by cattle ranchers on his father's side and gardeners on his mother's side. And his indigenous grandmother is the one who taught him to learn the names of native plants and the uses of native plants. And she said, you always keep your sources to yourself, but you always share your knowledge with as many other people as you can. So he sees her as a great influence in, sorry, I went too fast. Um, in his sort of the ethos that he brought to this land and what he wanted to do with it. So every garden in the book, the, the people in these gardens, in all of those big different bioregional spaces, um, they are all interested in reducing water use. They are all organic gardeners. They do not use any chemicals. Um, and, and as we know, not using chemicals is a big commitment to a lot of manual labor, a lot of pulling of weeds, a lot of greater tolerance for some things that we don't love, um, but we can afford to live with if it means not polluting our groundwater and poisoning our soil. And, um, you know, and a lot of people will say, well, you can't do it. You can't do it that way or you can't, you know. And these gardens are um, hopefully shifting the image of what beautiful looks like and what it takes to get to beautiful. And so this is their main grassland area. And I don't know if any of you have been to Marfa, but it's a big sort of, you know, like art and entertainment kind of a little quirky, but, um, you know, they have big festivals. And so they have little casitas along the side of the big house that are um, used as like Airbnb or for guests coming through. And one of his great desires with this garden was to display to other people exactly what you can do with a native, probably 90% native plant garden, and to display the diversity of a desert that looks pretty spare, but is in fact incredibly diverse. I think it has 36, 3,650 different native plant species, endemic, probably native and endemic to the, to the desert. And so while this is not a desert garden, it is giving little vignettes and curating kind of lushness that you would see in the desert at the height of uh, like the monsoon season. Um, these are what's, I love this shot. Um, one, you can see the Haystack Mountains off to the side, but um, you also see this little grove of emery oaks, which are native there. And, you know, it doesn't get very much rainfall. And uh, these were planted the first year that he started working there. And this is how much they've grown in, um, you know, 15 years. And he's really, really proud of them. They don't get a lot of water. By definition, a desert gets 10 or less inches a year. And theirs comes almost completely either in April or in July, August with the monsoons. And he, at this point, you know, doesn't do too much work. He says it's pretty low maintenance. He maybe works five hours a week, you know, kind of tidying a little bit, cutting some things back, staking things, whatever. But he fills the water basins every day, and it is, they're filled with birds, birds and snakes and frogs. And he says, when you wake up in the morning, 
and you see one of those water basins with life at it, you know you are doing something right. And I really love that. So this is one of the public gardens, the Natural History Museum of LA, um, the nature gardens at the um, Natural History Museum of LA County. And um, have any of you ever been there? It's, I'm seeing one nod. It's a phenomenal public garden. And it was a major innovate, um, a major undertaking in 2013 around the Natural History Museum Centennial. So it's one of these big old natural history museums, very kind of art deco. And uh, for their centennial, they decided to take their asphalt parking lot. This is one of the densest urban areas in the United States take their asphalt parking lot and turn it into a laboratory for exactly how much habitat an urban space can provide. And so every plant in the garden is chosen for its habitat value. So larval food, nectar, pollen, um, forage, nesting material, shelter, and for a specific species. So because it's a natural history museum, they are doing research on you know everything, on all the bugs, the beetles, the bats, the birds, the, the mammals. There are not a lot of large mammals other than humans and maybe raccoons that come into this, but they have managed to transform this asphalt parking lot into a major uh, sort of biodiversity hotspot in the city, and they've had been able to document at least 400 new species on the space since they have put it in. And one of the other things that they really make very, very visible is the importance of this idea of stacking functions. So that as they were designing it, they put together a team of scientists from the, um, the Natural History Museum itself so the entomologist, uh, the ornithologist, the soil science person, the uh, an, and a landscape designer from uh, landscape architect from LA, Mia Layer and Associates, um, developed the design. And at every phase, had the scientists sort of give input on the way the design was coming out. And so, for instance, the the building was being redone to connect the old building to this new garden, and they had this huge panel of glass um, on this new entrance because it was a very sort of beautiful and breathtaking um, view into a suspended skeleton. And the, the bird guy said, you can't have that. Like you put up that wall of glass and you are going to have so many dead birds on your hands. That is not the kind of nature gardens. And so they had to totally rethink. But the fact that they even included the entomologist and the ornithologist in this design process was really um, you know, important and critical to this being a good habitat garden. The other um, quote that I had from um, this interview process was one of the entomologists, Brian Brown, um, talked about the importance of living in the LA basin and recognizing that you lived essentially in a desert. It wasn't, you know, it's so modified by human culture over the last 150 years that you can't tell that anymore, but that's where you live. And so the importance of preserving the dryness to having an effective habitat garden was something that he was able to impress on the design team. And we, we as gardeners don't really think about that. You think, I want to water my stuff, right? Like it looks sad, I need to give it water. And you plant something, you've got to water it. And he, he pointed out that people will say, I love the horned lizard of the desert. I love that lizard. I think sometimes it's called a horned frog and, or toad, horned toad. Um, and you know what I'm talking about, the little like, spiny one, right? Um, people will say they love that, and then they will plant their garden, and they will put in irrigated turf, and the minute you irrigate a garden, you invite in non-native ants. And the minute you invite in non-native ants, the non-native ants push out the native harvester ants. And that is the primary food of this lizard. So if you really love this lizard, you need to preserve the dry of your garden. And in the West, as gardeners, that is um, you know, securing water rights and water law. These are big deals. But 
seeing, um, and, and we had a great tour with Mariah, and she, was, she had this great sort of phrase about how every garden, every farm has its own, um, how did it go exactly? Its own disadvantage that is its greatest advantage. And I think we failed to see what an advantage our arid climate can be as gardeners, and that's an important thing to remember. Um, so this garden, oh wait, so I wanted to go back to the stacking functions. So one of the things that I really love about this garden is this stacked stone wall. And they had a different design, and they you know, did a lot of work to source things quite locally. Um, and all of the plants came from the LA Basin. It is not 100% native, and I love their thinking on this as well, they really wanted to include some of the historic naturalized plants of the LA area, uh, like the jacaranda tree, or um, there's, there were others as well that they kept in the garden, because those were important culturally familiar plants to the people who now live in LA. And so that helped them to feel at home in this garden. And um, so, but it's primarily native, and all the natives are sourced from the LA basin, um, so that they are regionally native plants. And then this wall serves multiple purposes because not only does it become a sort of raised bed for this large planting that's in it and create the drainage that you need, but it also buffers this walkway from the downtown LA street that's on the other side of it plus it works as a living wall for invertebrates to be living and nesting in, and uh, great little wall plantings all along the way for some of our driest loving plants. Um, and it is a beautiful, beautifully curated garden. And one of the, uh, Carol Bornstein was the director of the garden for many years. She retired this year, uh, and she is a wonderful Western native plants woman, but she actually discovered this little Encelia, the little yellow flower, in the garden and was able to name it Paleo Yellow for the native, uh, the Natural History Museum. And it has uh, little spaces for seclusion, it has fresh water, which as any habitat garden needs to have fresh water. Uh, this is one of it, the great sources of bug diversity and bird diversity in the garden. And she says one of the most important things about the garden is the fact that with that rate of urbanization in our country, um, it will be gardens and public green spaces that introduce a great many people, even older people, not just the new generations, to what nature actually is. And that in LA, it takes so long to get out of the city to get to anything that is, you know, natural nature, uh, that this is sometimes the first and only place people will encounter the native plants and ecosystems of their area. And that's uh, a pretty weighty task. And if they meet those plants and love them here, then when they meet them out in the wild, they will actually recognize them and care for them as familiar and family even. Um, so this is a great garden in Hood River, Oregon, and this is a home garden uh, designed and uh, cared for in large part by Sheila. And she is a grandmother and a retired artist and she wanted her final garden to be all about habitat, habitat for her grandchildren to learn about birds and bugs. And she put all of her time and energy into the landscape around her house, providing um, food and forage for the birds and the insects. And she wanted to be all native and all locally native. And so she too put together a team of scientists to inform her from her regional extension agency and um, uh, watershed conservation district to tell her exactly which plants to include. And when she got done with her home garden, she kept looking across her front yard at the uh, sort of common area of her little subdivision, and it was a weedy mess. And she said, I don't want that to look like that and that to not host any creatures while my garden is looking like this and hosting these creatures. And she said the best way to get anything done 
for a garden in your community is to find the grandparents because they have time, they have a little money, and they care. And so she got all the grandparents in her subdivision to come and weed out this particular uh, common area, and then they replanted it with the help of this scientific team, and it's now accredited uh, habitat uh, bird wildlife sanctuary. And that just goes to show you, you know, what one person caring about this can do and pass forward uh, to the people and the areas around them. And it's beautiful. And then we have Isa Cato's Mojo Gardens. And one of the things I really, who here has visited Mojo Gardens? So you know that it is like floriferous and beautiful and it is welcoming in, in all of the ways that a garden should be welcoming. And it's not just welcoming to humans, but it's welcoming to the plants and wildlife of her region. And when I interviewed Isa for the book, and then again recently for uh, the podcast, uh, one of the things she kept talking about was hospitality, like the importance to her and her family of hospitality. And how that for her, that really extended to the plants and the wildlife of her area. And that when she realized her land backs up against BLM land, once she realized that a fence across her garden uh, would really impede the, the migratory patterns of the elk in her area, she decided to take the fence down, knowing that the, fen, the, that the elk coming through could potentially destroy her garden. And she decided that that was a risk worth taking, and that in fact what happened was not that they destroyed her garden, but that they added to the vibrancy of her garden in that they cut things down, they, they pruned, and they basically coppiced certain things so that they came back even better the next year. And, um, and that's not to say she wants them to like tear down every single plant in her, in her garden or trees, uh, but she has figured out ways to you know, put in different berms, make uh, uncomfortable situations for them that don't stop their, their migration, but that uh, help redirect them a little bit without excluding them. And that kind of mindset is, I think, a really important one as we go forward as gardeners in, in our lives. Because, you know, as the Natural History Museum demonstrated, one urban garden can be the difference for a bee or a bird or a butterfly trying to get across an urban landscape that is essentially a wasteland. And every single urban fragment counts in reweaving corridors for these creatures to be welcome in our spaces and welcome in our world and potentially actually persist in our world. And so finally, I will introduce you to um, a retreat center up in Cody, Wyoming. And that was that very first shot that I said, what happens when you look at a garden like this and you live in a place like this? Um, and Cody, Wyoming is pretty, pretty spare if you've been there. And, um, you know, the high plains, high desert, high wind, very cold is uh, one of the harsher environments. And this is an Episcopal retreat center in Cody, Wyoming. I'm not really sure why the Episcopal diocese chose Cody, but they did. And um, the, the husband and wife team who came on about 20 years ago to become the caretakers uh, for the retreat center were not gardeners. They were people that had been working in the hospitality industry, interestingly enough. And the minute that they came onto this site in Cody, Wyoming, and they saw this space that were little retreat cabins surrounded by irrigated turf lawn. And this irrigated turf and these cultivated gardens looked terrible. And this man, uh, Jay, recognized immediately that if you were going to have someone come to a religious retreat center to meditate and feel serene and close to God, the last thing you wanted them to do was see a garden that looked like these spaces. And so he began to educate himself by going to 
the Denver Botanic Gardens, introducing himself to other native plant experts in the region and becoming conversant in the native plants, in the well-adapted plants. And he took out all the turf grass and he has put in flower gardens. He has hand transplanted little flowering cactuses and some of the stones and some of the sedums. And then he has supplemented them with native and non-native plants that have created these beautiful little vignettes that really, they don't compete with the larger scene, but they make a softness as you go across. And now when people walk the gardens, this is as much their sort of, you know, their retreat atmosphere as sitting in quiet contemplation inside. Um, and some of his native plant selections, this Penstemon perii, and I don't know every single plant in every single one of these pictures, but I have it all down in the book, so if you have a specific plant question, I can help you at the end. Maybe I can help you at the end. But, um, and over the many years, and he also retired this last year, over the many years that he took care of this space, he also created this labyrinth. And he hand collected every single one of these stones from the 350 acre site. And he did it very, very intentionally and carefully to not destroy habitat in any one area, to not take all the rock out of one outcrop, but to uh, very methodically create this chart pattern labyrinth. And he says in the interview that the difference between gardening and prayer is very little because you are just on your hands and knees praying to something bigger than yourself. And, um, you know, in these gardens, you come to recognize that it is as much about listening to the land and the soil and the climate and the place as it is about listening to what you want out of your garden or what you hope your garden will look like for your next party. Um, that it is about being in, engaged and a participant in the life that goes on around us. Because in the end, right, our gardens aren't just places. They are places and they are married to our larger places, but they are also in many ways, and, and I think of how, you know, Rock Bottom Ranch came to be part of ACES or Hallam Lake became to be part of ACES. And all of our gardens are also, they are social and moral documents. They are contracts that we make with this land that we're working on. And in that way, they are a narrative that we can read. If we learn how and we, we are slowed down enough to look, we can read any picture, we can read any garden, and we can see not only what is there, but what is cared for there, or what is not there, and what is not cared for there. And in this way, they aren't just narratives, but they are they are love letters, and they are prayers, and they are praise songs, and they connect us to our larger world on all of these levels, on a physical level, a communal level, a metaphysical level. And in that way, they're maps that are guiding us as to exactly who we are and our best selves and where we are. And of course, in that way, we are found as a species. And we are right here at home. And I thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>